why they won't make the album. Because I'm a huge, well, it, well. <laughs> Fusion music actually was the real kind of uh, the fire that I needed to shoot me in the direction of becoming a bass player. And I grew up on all of the, the great fusion bands of the like, you know, late 80s for me, early 90s. Weather Report, Brand X, Tribal Tech, Chick Corea Electric Band, Brecker Brothers, Yellow Jackets. Alan Holsworth was huge for me. Mavi, how do you spell, how do you pronounce Mavi, Mavinishi? I'll, you can say that one. <laughs> the goal was to create a fusion album. Like, within the first call to Simon, I was like, let's do a fusion album. <laughs> yeah, rather than on so am, I, am I the, the friendly one or the grumpy one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was, uh, I was pleasantly energized um, when I heard about the scale of the project, it's difficult not to get excited about being in a room with your favourite musicians and people you've listened to since you were, since you were 15 years old. And actually, you know, a lot of people said to me, it's just like, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'd just make the most of it and have a huge amount of fun, which is what we both did. It just kind of was like, wow, that is like unapologetically fusion. It's a power fusion thing. It's probably the most intense music I've made in a while, you know? And I dig that actually, because it's just like, wow, they, they really love this music and it's done really well. And it just seemed like it would be fun. How have I prepared? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, I just prepare myself right before the session because I want to be, you know, fresh and clean. I don't like to listen a lot because I'm a big believer of of getting like a fresh impression. I love the music. There's a lot of challenges and such a joy to play. And you know, we have such a good band, so it's just easy breezy. It's been really interesting actually, yeah. So like, obviously a lot of moving parts. <laughs> but now they're starting to move, which is great. So, Lord of the Rings, the first one, episode one, whatever it is called, right? So, like, you're in the Shire. Well, imagine that there's a beautiful recording studio with a chapel attached to it, beautiful Tudor building, and you plonk it in the Shire, okay? It's kind of like that, less hobbits, but it's, it's that kind of vibe. Like, look at it. It's like a church. Uh, is it an 800-year-old chapel? Yeah. Attached to a man, like, is it a mansion? Yes. It's a manor house. It's a large manor house <laughs> slash mansion. It's freaking awesome. So there's a lot of history behind the place. And there's bodies in there. There's bodies. There's gravestones on the wall. And the family so, tomb is underneath the drum riser. Yeah. It's chilling. I told Gurgo that earlier, to, yesterday, actually, I was like, by the way, there's three bodies under there. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, location's great. And it's residential, so we can stay there. But because of size, history with Matt and George, he had just sort of like a really great confidence in them and, and their abilities. So I was just sort of like, yeah, great. He, he, made, the, he made the call. How big a project was it? Freaking big, bigger than I thought. I've wanted to make an album for, for years, but I've got a neurological movement disorder called focal dystonia, which is how I got into, you know, like doing what I do now, which is like being on YouTube and running sort of like an online music school and stuff like that. Um, and the neurological movement disorder means it's hard for me to, I can play in short bursts, but with me, the more I play, the more the symptoms come on. So that kind of put me in a situation where I always wanted to make, you know, do an album, but I just couldn't because of this neurological movement disorder, especially, especially given that the tunes were really challenging intricate you know through composed there were hard tunes to do and we couldn't we couldn't just do take upon take upon take upon take because we had four days to do the nine tunes and we'd flown people in so yeah it was uh, it did add extra uh, uh yeah extra sweat under the collar yeah. <laughs> 
day one of the uh, the ascent. Slightly relieved that everyone made it to the UK. <laughs> Firstly, and now we can just worry about making music. One of the most productive days I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Do you not want to get a few more toms? Go on now. True. <laughs> I went to Dan earlier and I was like, have we got any water? And he said, no, but we've got beer. Yeah, loads of beer. <laughs> yeah, loads of beer. My name is Scott Devine. Um, I am here in the beautiful English countryside. Uh, sheep running by. <laughs> 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 Yeah, a little bit of anxiety about this week because there's a lot of moving parts and bringing guys across the world to uh, to the Midlands. I'm bagging it, yeah. I feel like I'm stepping off a cliff and, um, and I'm hoping that everything's going to be all right. Like, I think that everything's going to be all right. And I know it, but I feel like I'm sort of like stepping into the unknown. I haven't played four days straight for a decade because the more I play in like more consecutive days, the more chance there is of my hands just having, you know, meltdown and, and me not being able to play at all. So, which in most situations would be manageable. But when, you, when you've flown a bunch of guys over from the States to record an album and hired a team to video it and all of that malarkey, uh, then it's, it gets... Uh, yeah, it gets uh, problematic. But I think it's going to be fine. Band are great. They're a bit jet-lagged because most of them are from LA. So it just gave them the ability to acclimatise to uh, to the studio and stuff like that, which is beautiful. It was great to see the studio, actually, because I didn't know what to expect. I'd seen, like, photos of it online. But... No, no, we haven't recorded anything today at all, no. It was... Um... It was just sort of like getting, you know, getting set up and getting comfortable and stuff like that. But we haven't run any tunes yet. We're trying to do nine tracks. And to keep up with uh, with the pace, we need to... We've got a schedule that we need to hit. So tomorrow we're going to do three. I think it'll be fine. Um, but I say that kind of like knowing not what it's going to be like when we actually sort of like get up and going because most of the tunes that we're doing are actually sort of like really uh, involved and there's lots of unison lines it's really orchestrated it's yeah it's, it's gonna be difficult i guess sort of like it's something that if you had just a a little bit of time to uh to to, to rehearse with a band it, it would be fine but we don't have any time to rehearse with the band we're going to run the tracks a couple of times and then we're going to record it so so it's like that cross section of you know, zero time to rehearse, and we're just going to record it in the studio. Oh, and by the way, just for fun, we're going to film it as well. And none of us have played together. Ever, I don't think. Let me think. Yeah, none of us have played together before either. I think we've done all... Today, I think we've done all we needed to do. Um, just great to hear the guys warming up and stuff, and it's starting to become real now, which is which is really exciting. It's like hearing these tracks over the last few months just on the on the computer and now they're starting to sound real there's kind of human elements coming into it now which is which is really interesting i think gergo and uh and uh, nate have played to, with each other oh and gergo's played with with scott kinsey as well so they've played together it's just us the noobs <laughs> <laughs> Well, Scott is a legend of the bass. He's probably educated more bass players than anyone in the world, um, but he's also a terrific player as well, and I've sort of known him for both of those personalities over the years. Combining not getting in the way of soloists and other, other sort of melodic things that are going on, but also, you know, occupying that big real estate at the bottom. As a, as a chordal player or a soloist, it just did exactly what you wanted it to. Yeah. 
So I first heard of Simon when I was living in Leeds and he was kind of sort of like a like a legend within that sort of like, you know, within that community because he plays everything to an extreme degree. So he's an amazing guitar player, obviously, which he's doing on this project, but he's also a frightening bass player, amazing drums, plays keys, um, I'm probably missing stuff out. Oh, Gav plays trumpet. Yeah, like he plays all of these instruments and he's uh, to an incredible level. So with this project in mind, I was like, he was just perfect for it because I knew that he was an amazing composer as well. So, and I really wanted somebody to sort of like carry the brunt of that sort of like the composing side of it because I've got like zero extra hours in the day. So Simon was just a perfect fit for it. Composing this music was a tremendous amount of fun and I really like getting things in a magnified way, so working on each bar individually. So when I write jazz, I kind of think about the whole composition as a whole, but when I wrote this, I was sort of doing things bar by bar because it's, you know, when you have sort of all of these layers and all of these kind of sounds and timbres laying on top of each other, creating melodies that ride over complex harmonies isn't the same sort of approach, or well, at least it isn't for me anyway. So I really enjoyed kind of the building block method of, you know, writing. So I, I, would, I would work on two bar, two bars at a time and get them sounding great and then move on to the next one and then just check the flow. These are all through composed, which is, you know, doesn't necessarily follow the standard form. I recorded the the music in the way that was almost like a finished product. So the tracks were supplied to the musicians in a very complete way. I sort of found it a more natural way to get the, the, you know, making sure the tunes flowed as compositions to actually play them myself and then effectively transcribe what I played. And actually, it's a workflow that I'm very used to. I spend a lot of my musical life making tracks and building tracks from the ground up. So it was quite natural for me to do that. And actually hearing, you know, having a fairly good idea of what the tunes were going to sound like before we went to the studio, I think was my way of relaxing myself as a musician and knowing that at least the notes on the page were roughly correct. But also I think it's a, it was a courtesy to the musicians to have a good quality demo, and I think it was part of the reason why we managed to recruit such amazing players successfully, because they, they had a really good idea how the music was going to sound. So it's like 71 on the nose would be... Yeah, so... No one likes to admit that, um, that they like fusion, but it's one of those things a lot of people, especially if people of our generation, grew up listening to that. And I'll be honest with you, when I first listened to it, I thought it was a load of shit. I thought it was really, really unpleasant to listen to. But then I listened to it again three weeks later, just because I was bored, and I noticed so many other things about it. And that was when I kind of learned that listening to fusion music is like unraveling layers every time it's such a complex um, genre that every time you listen to it things different things are exposed with you know that was the kind of idiom that sort of shaped me as a musician there's there's an ego to it as well because it's an incredibly difficult kind of music to play so there is that going for it as well it's a challenge you know it's an exciting challenge to play that kind of music so. Yeah. Just your words. We can just put, we can pull it out because I've got it. I'm, I'm unison with you anyway, am I? So I like the sound that you can get in the live thing like this. The post-production stuff can be a lot harder if it's recorded like this because you don't have as many options. Or if somebody messes something up and like, oh, it's bleeding into that, so we all either all have to do it again oh, or whatever. Shit. Right, it's my bad. Sorry. Yeah. So, so you. 
Right yeah. Anyway, it's yeah, like I said, it's you're pro you're more than likely right. Okay, I'm just gonna play like that. Right, yeah. One more Yes, it was a, a, a day of intense highs and a couple of a couple of personal lows, um, but just wonderful actually, and kind of on a fanboy level, just level one hundred, <laughs> just like just actually sitting and playing melodies with Scott Kinsey, doing massive pad kind of keyboard stuff underneath. That was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, it was a real eye opener seeing how these guys sort of find the exact right space to sit underneath whatever's going on. And actually, David Binney was just an absolute monster today as well. Just hearing, just hearing the guy warm up is enough to, uh, is enough to scare anyone. I write these pieces and it's like I'm tying my own noose. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was, a, it was, in the end, it was fantastic. And again, we're kind of learning as we go on with this stuff, you know. Um, Can I talk as well? I'm <laughs> too side. No, it has to be him to talk. He kicked one of these. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that like one of my biggest takeaways was that you know, like they're, they're phenomenal like they're ridiculous but it still doesn't mean that we can just sort of like play one track straight off and it's going to sound wicked because you need to let that shit like bed in in terms of sort of like getting the feel and find what everybody's feeling the actual where everybody's sitting on the grid you know and it just takes a little bit of time sometimes to get comfortable with that and it doesn't mean that you know that we wouldn't be able to do it and nail it for the first time but what it does mean is that when you listen back it just doesn't gel as well as it needs to so we just you know we played i think that we played each of the tracks about well, like three or four times three was it times, yeah. three to five times maybe yeah and i think it was worth doing that because every time we were like should we do one more take we did this a couple of times on a few tunes and we did it we're like oh that felt way better when we listened back to it in the control room somewhere I'm really glad we took the time to do that so that was wicked you know there's it, there's no passengers allowed with this kind of music you know, and you can't, there's no sort of sitting back on stuff because it's incredibly complex music that's changing all the time. A lot of these pieces are through composed from start to finish. So there's, it's very, it's not like a jazz scenario where you have a head, solos in the head and everyone knows the changes of the same 32 bars over and over. Well, these aren't, they're constantly changing. So it requires a lot. And I think, you know, even a couple, I'm not going to say, but like, you know, a couple of the guys today were, you know, finding it very tiring you know, sort of keeping on track and keeping on the grid, uh, as Scott said, you know, so it's like... Yeah, there's a few things today that was just like, oh, that sounded crap, we needed to do that again. And I don't think that it was, you know, I think all of us struggled with different elements as well mm -hmm. through the tunes, even though these, like, you know, obviously these guys are sort of like the best in the world at what they do, everybody struggled with sort of like certain bits of it, mm -hmm. and, and that's great. And it, yeah, well, not, maybe struggle's the uh, the wrong word, but, you know, they, were, they didn't, you know, just sort of like, we didn't put down the charts and we all just sailed through. It was like, oh, you know, we need to look at this bit, we need to look at that bit, oh, you know, how are you feeling this thing? And, you know, so I think it's, uh, yeah, as Sai said, it's like super challenging, but I think that that is the cool thing about the music itself, you know. The actual written part of it is, is you know, even the slightest thing out of place stands out like a sore thumb, and it's yeah. like similar when you're watching a film and something removes the suspension of disbelief, you know, it's like something that takes you around. That's the challenge, is kind of remaining in that, in that mode with this music. But then when it comes to the improv, I mean, that thing with David over game theory, just ridiculous. That kind of New York 55 bar stuff just yeah. kept coming. And it was just, oh man, it's exactly what I, th mm. you know, it was just like, oh Jesus, that's, yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> I can remember living in Leeds, um, hanging out in the, this bed set, two in the morning, drinking, 
uh, listening to David Binney's records and all of us freaking out about how freaking, you know, how much of a freak he was in all of the greatest ways. It's not that hard, so it's, it does, I play a lot of really hard music and I have in the past. When I'm playing, like you might have seen me yesterday, sometimes it looks like I was saying to Simon today, I'm sorry if I look like I'm bored, or like I'm, my head isn't, I'm like this, but I'm actually really listening and projecting like when I come in for solo or whatever, where, what am I going to do basically based on what's happening and all that stuff. But yeah, it's good. I like this place too. The great track I think that he played on was um, Hypersphere and he plays his solo and it's just phenomenal. It's just the story arc he takes you on through that, yeah, bonkers. As soon as you hear Dave Benny, you know it's Dave Benny. Dave has an amazing combination of just rawness, huge levels of intensity, but is an incredibly touching player as well at times, and he has this ability to just go through so many gears that you didn't think existed. Yeah, like, How did we pick the band? We mentioned names, but then I think Scott, we were struggling with a keyboard player, weren't we? Let's be honest. Yeah. And, it, yeah. I, and Scott Kinsey never really occurred to me just because he was, you know, such a fucking legend. Because it was legend, Scott Kinsey. Scott's just a legend, you know. He like was, you know, one of the members of Tribal Tech and, and did all of them albums that I've been listening to for like two decades. And then on the way home from a gig, <laughs> I just, maybe I had a beer or something. And I was like, yeah, it's going to go message Scott on Instagram. And it was like, messing with that, do you want to come and do an album? Here are the dates. And it was like, yeah, sounds great. I was like, and then I messaged Simon, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I think Scott Kinsey's coming to do it. So it was, yeah, it's freaking awesome. I've been checking out Scott's bass lessons for a while, you know, but I didn't know he knew me. He has a really just completely unique approach to tone and sound on his instruments. So to be sat next to him and hear those sounds that I've heard for the last, you know, two decades, right there next to me was just absolutely phenomenal. So like, just loved his approach on all of the tracks. When I was playing a solo and I could hear this warm blanket of keyboard pad sounds underneath me that just reminded me just being a young player, because that's what I heard on the albums. And it was just a hell of an experience having that under my solo. And you, you just got a sense of, you know, what it felt like to be Scott Henderson for about a tenth of a second. So this is really a special thing uh, that we're all actually getting together, you know, in, in one room and actually making this music. So with Nate, I loved what the, the energy that the percussion brought to the project because when it was Simon that actually originally said, hey, we should get a percussion player. I think initially Scott was questioning whether we needed percussion on the album. It was a little bit of a wild card, but all of my favorite fusion albums, Weather Report, etc., have this really dynamic element in the background with you know a conga player or a timbale player or, or extra things, and they, it just adds an extra depth to things, and actually it gives it a legitimacy as well. Yeah. 
so um, so hearing Nate play with the tracks, then I was like, oh, it made sense. Simon was right. We needed a percussion player. Percussion is very different from any other instrument, right? Like it, on records, traditionally, there's like five to 20 layers of instruments. And so on a live take, essentially I'm having to consolidate or choose what I think is most important. And then on some of this stuff, you'll see or hear like a few layers here and there. Highlights about Gergo, he was just phenomenal. He's just an absolute monster of a player. What's incredible about Gergo is that when you think he's at 10, <laughs> when you think he's at 10, he's actually not there. And I've never kind of experienced that before. When you think somebody's at their limit and then suddenly they're just like, Ugh, and you're like, oh, there's extra. I was blown away with just how professional Gergo was. I think it was a real lesson for me in how someone can be workmanlike but also virtuosic and combine the two things. Gergo, Gergo's a very funny guy and a great guy to be around. Um, he's, he plays like a machine, but a machine who's a really human, amazing machine. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good enough reason for me just to make it fit in with the rest of the album. I'm right. quite keen. To, I'm quite keen to keep the line by, but I think like that's a good reason to make it slot in with everything else. So, so yeah. It's it nice. wouldn't be a Latin vibe though. You realize that, right? It would be like a well, yeah, quite was, white, yeah, yeah, approach. So that's not Latin. Yeah, cool. you know, it's right. like it would be like Hallmark Latin. <laughs> Again, we're elevating no. it. <laughs> so finally someone improved on Latin. Yeah, stuff, exactly. You know? yeah. Hello. That feel good. Yeah, feels good to me. Yeah. Yeah. That feels more natural. Feels good. To me, it's almost the same. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I don't really hear where that's not that different from what what we started with. Hmm. Is it? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I'm going, if, if I here, play what you're playing. Yeah. So like that's like yeah. it, it doesn't sound like I'm supposed to play that. Right. But like the ding but oh beep beep. Yeah. Oh. So to me it's a little more linear, a little more funky. <laughs> day three or five, second day of recording. Another amazing day, really. Days of day of kind of roller coaster day. Yeah, I mean they've basically systematically rewrote all of my music today. <laughs> but, but yeah, we figured we've we've we're sort of kind of well, it's, it's it occurred to me that we're, we're we're sort of making the music for these particular players, aren't we now? Well, I'd rather drive my face into a sharp spike than get somebody on the freaking. In, in the studio that's not going to bring their personality to it. I hate that. That's like the opposite of what, of what I want. I actually, even though it was hard today um, at points because Cy had written this tune, it was done in a particular style and and they wanted to approach it in a different way. And we were like, yeah. and it was obviously more it was, complex than just, you know, 
Yeah. Like it's written. It was, it was it was it was what proper bands do. Yeah, and that is they adapt stuff to suit. And then at the end, the, the end was freaking awesome. But they did what jazz musicians do, and they, and they made it their own, you know, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, it was wicked, and and they felt comfortable enough as well to sort of like push back and be like, actually, let's do a different vibe on mm. this, you know, because they could have just been to your point. They could have just said, yeah, let's just let's play it as written, but they weren't. They were. They were just like, no, nah, let's not do that. Let's just do something that sounds more authentic to this band, which mm. I think is great. And uh, yeah, and it sounded fucking amazing for it as well. Had I ever um, thought about the vibe, like the, the personalities, and and I hadn't, it was interesting because I, I was struck by people's personalities. And actually, within the uh, within the musicians that we brought in, there were actually really really quiet individuals, really quiet, thoughtful, and I'm not. I'm kind of, um, I can be a bit excitable. Imagine sort of like a, not like a super young puppy, six month puppy. That's kind of what you get with me, kind of uh, excitable and, uh, and, and silly a lot of the time, right? And, uh, and it was interesting trying to kind of get the, the vibe right or just maneuver around it. And like obviously put into that jet lag and, and all of that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Punching there. Can we punch in from here? Sorry. I actually, can I go, can we go from the start? Because I fucked up. They're really suffering from jet lag now. I think that the first two days, the they actually sort of like were just, you know, and I've been there, do you know what I mean? Like, you're sort of like, oh, it's fine, you know. A few of them today were just crushed. So there were certain logistical challenges with being at Vader. So it's in rural Warwickshire. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's, you know, we're, it's, it's a heavenly countryside. It's, it's a beautiful place to be, very calming. If you're used to the city and you're used to LA, perhaps it's quite a contrast. So I hope the guys really enjoyed the taste of quintessential kind of green and pleasant England. Um, there was a few anomalies with um, hotel bookings that I'm sure uh, will be revealed. <laughs> yeah, so when we were looking for a hotel for the uh, for the guys that were flying in, we were looking for good hotels in the area and and we saw this this place and it looked like phenomenal. It was basically a castle. I can remember seeing this thing on the on online thinking I'm having to stay at the studio in the digs and these guys are staying in this castle. What's up? Anyway, so so we booked this castle for them, right? It looked amazing. And it turns out that it's like their deal is that it is a hotel for old folks, right? So like for, yeah, old age pensioners to, uh, I don't know, to do what they do, like, you know. Yeah, there's a spa. Oh, wow. Cool. There's archery. Archery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's billiards. Yeah, yeah. There's Croquet. activities. I think they took it all in great spirits, yeah. It's Winter's eighth birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Story, do you want to say hello? Hi. Hello. <laughs> Day four or five. Day four or five. Finish line. Finish line in sight. In sight. More in sight than it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, yeah, well, we're currently sat in the the uh, control room of Vader Studios, which has been an absolute pleasure to be at. It's just a wonderful place to be, just an amazing surroundings and just lovely people to work with. So I think for these, for these guys coming from LA to just see this, see the best bit of, you know, the best of kind of rural England, the green and green and pleasant land. Yeah, it's been it's beautiful. It's been great for them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, silent de delineation. Delineation, do yeah, you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah. Don't even know what that means. Delineation. It doesn't really mean anything. It's a, it's a, it's a headache. It's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. The way that it's written, it can be felt in a bunch of different 
times where the pulse is different. Ultimately, I had to ignore the click at the end. It was like one, two, three. I was like, la, 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 la. <laughs> and there's two chords, ba, ba, at the beginning. That's all I was waiting for. Ba, ba, and, I, ba, da, ba, 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 and then I played my bit. And then, yeah, and then got in like that. Next song. Scuttlefish. Yeah. Scuttlefish, which again doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah, we found that there's no scuttlefish. I thought there was, and yeah. then now there isn't. So no. we'll, we might call it Scuttle Bus or Scuttle <laughs> something. That might be a working title. But, um, scuttle Bus. Uh, um, scuttle is, well, it's a, a cold scuttle, it's like right. a shovel, but you can I also. like a beetle scuttling. You can scuttle and you can scuttle a boat, which means, I think it means to evacuate a boat before oh, sinking yeah, it. Yeah, so you can yeah. scuttle a sub and it's, it goes down. Anyway. We digress. Um, <laughs> Scuttlefish is really like a, um, a hom- homage to um, the kind of Schofield oh, 90s oh, Brecker yeah, Brothers type of stuff, and it's yeah. kind of just unashamedly fusion. As many slash chords as you could put in one on, on one page of music. That's that's that. I have, and it sounds like a. And hearing David Benny just playing blues is quite quite a thing. That was really cool. You know, I've been kind of invested in these in these charts and in, in invested in this music. And it's like there's a few occasions when things didn't quite pan out the way I thought they were going to pan out with the musicians, which is totally cool and, and to be expected. But you know, that's something you kind of you have to sort of live with, I guess. And you know, I think listening back to what we've got, I'm so pleased. You know, especially some of the the ones we did today. There was there was some linchpin charts today. The charts that I really think are the the kind of best. We so, sort of yeah. saved them to today, so we you know everyone had a chance to kind of get a good road into playing with each other. And I'm so chuffed with the way that these two went today. Like, and they sound so so fucking good. You know, were these two today the ones that you were like, oh shit? I hope I, they go okay. Was yeah, it, yeah. Well, I think those are the ones. They're the real statement pieces for me. These two. They're the ones that define this out. This this album for yeah. me. They're like. They put, they make this album what it is. Yeah. The other ones are great, but they kind of they float around these two. I think we had the opportunity to to record a third one, which means tomorrow we'd just be doing one. So it'd be a bit, you know, knees up. So, but well, I mean, if you think about this week, there's, we've played a lot of notes between us this week. Yeah, there's a lot of notes gone down. There's a lot there. of notes. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah, fair enough. I think it's one of these things you kind of suck it and see it. And actually, on this occasion, I had to sort of. Like you just occasionally need someone to say, listen, let's let's just hit it with fresh eyes in the morning. Yeah. That was good. That's it. I think that's it. I think we're that's good okay. for now. I really love the idea of doing an album that was, you know, like focused on that approach to um, to music. You know, guys like Alan Holdsworth and Tribal Tech and Chick Corea and all of them amazing artists. They're the musicians that I grew up on. Because I just don't think that, you know, that music's been done that much now and I think it's a shame I think it's you know it's really um, it was really influential to myself and Simon and uh, and the, the level of musicianship as well on those albums is like mind boggling with the I guess the sort of like the change in the music industry over the last 10 to 15 years all of the record companies have just dissolved and gone to nothing right so they really struggle to fund their own projects because the money's not there that used to be available and i think it's really freaking sad because a lot of them have actually stopped making that music that they obviously loved 
So it was always, the idea was always to make a fusion album and, and hopefully inspire other people to make a fusion album too. had the people involved that were don't leave things to chance. We had amazing players, an amazing support team. They were a tremendously exciting bunch of musicians to be around and actually very unique personalities. And it was really fascinating to see how those personalities rendered so accurately through into their playing. Today we've just done the final mix of the album and I'm, f I'm feeling absolutely over the moon with the mixes and the tracks. I'm feeling super pumped about that. It's a guilty secret, and that is what we love fusion. And it's everyone's guilty secret, really. Everyone, no one likes to admit. Nine compositions, some of the finest musicians in the world, and I'm feeling great about it. Yeah, that's all I've got. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You had to sort of describe, I don't know, the whole process in sort of just one sentence. What would you say? Intense. One word. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, if you want to add a few more words. Um, intense, but amazing. <laughs>